Welcome to another episode of the Understand Crypto series. I'm going to begin a series of episodes focusing on the Lightning Network. And this first episode is will be introduction to the Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network, often abbreviated as LN, is changing the way people exchange value online. And it's one of the most exciting advancements to happen in Bitcoin's history. So um, today, the Lightning Network is still very early on and still going through a lot of change. But it's basically a protocol for using Bitcoin in a smart, non-obvious way. It's often described as a second layer technology on top of Bitcoin. We're going to go through what is the Lightning Network. We'll talk about some of the terminology. We'll talk in general about trust and decentralized networks. We'll talk a little bit about fairness protocols. And we'll talk about fairness in Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, and we'll talk about the motivation behind the Lightning Network, and we'll talk about the defining features of the Lightning Network in this lecture. So the concept of the Lightning Network was proposed in 2015, and the first implementation was actually launched in 2018. Uh, we're only beginning to see the opportunities the Lightning Network provides to Bitcoin, including improved privacy, speed, and scale. With core knowledge of the Lightning Network, you can help to shape the future of the network while also building opportunities for yourself. Now, before I go any further in this lecture, I'm going to assume that the viewer has some basic knowledge of Bitcoin. Uh, but if not, don't worry too much. Uh, I'm going to explain the most important Bitcoin concepts uh, and those that you have to know to understand the Lightning Network. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, you can check out the other uh, videos that I put on this channel around Bitcoin. While some knowledge of programming is helpful for this, because there's going to be a lot of programming terminology in this, I'm going to try to treat these programming concepts at a high le conceptual level. So you won't actually have to do any programming as part of understanding these lectures. So let's take a look at some of the basic concepts that um, are necessary to develop and understanding the Lightning Network. You know, some of these technical terminology might seem at first a bit confusing. Um, if you don't understand all the words in these definitions yet, that's okay. You'll understand more as we move through the lectures. So our first term is a pretty fundamental term. It's the blockchain, uh, which we're going to define as a distributed transaction ledger produced by a network of computers. Bitcoin, for example, is a system that produces a blockchain of Bitcoin transactions. The Lightning Network is not itself a blockchain, nor does it produce a bit blockchain. It is a network that relies on an existing external blockchain, i.e. Bitcoin, for its security. Node, a computer that participates in a network. A Lightning node is a computer that participates in the Lightning network. A Bitcoin node is a computer that participates in the Bitcoin network. Typically, a Lightning node user will run a Lightning node and a Bitcoin node. And we'll talk about why later on, but this gets into this whole layer two thing. And so Lightning nodes rely on the layer one Bitcoin nodes. On-chain versus off-chain, a payment is on-chain if it's recorded as a transaction on the Bitcoin or the underlying blockchain. Payments sent via payment channels between Lightning nodes, uh, which are not visible in the underlying blockchain, are called off-chain payments. Usually in the Lightning network, the only on-chain transactions are those used to open and close a Lightning payment channel. A third type of channel modifying transaction exists called splicing, which can be used to add, remove the amount of funds committed in a Lightning channel. Payment. When value is exchanged in the Lightning network, we call this a payment as compared to a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Payment channel. A financial relationship between two nodes in the Lightning network, typically implemented by multi-signature Bitcoin transactions that share control over the Bitcoin between the two Lightning nodes. Uh, routing versus sending, unlike Bitcoin, where transactions are sent by broadcasting them to 
all of the nodes in the Bitcoin blockchain. Lightning is a routed network where payments are routed across one or more payment channels following a path from sender to recipient. And transaction, a data structure that records the transfer of control over some funds, like for example, Bitcoin. Uh, the Lightning Network relies on Bitcoin transactions or those of another blockchain to track control of funds. Um, a couple other definitions, which I didn't include on the slides, uh, would be cryptography. We're gonna, you know, because Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, we are going to be dealing with some cryptography concepts in these lectures. So, for example, uh, digital signatures are mathematical schemes for verifying the authenticity of digital messages or documents. A valid digital signature gives a recipient reason to believe the message was created by a known sender. The sender cannot deny having sent the message and that the message was not altered in transit. Uh, and a related cryptographic concept is a hash function. A hash function, a cryptographic hash function is a mathematical algorithm that maps data of arbitrary size to a bit string of a fixed size, which is a hash, and is designed to be a one-way function. That is a function which is uh, unpractical to send in the reverse direction. More detailed definitions of these and many other terms can be found online and in other lectures. Throughout these lectures, I'm going to explain what these concepts mean and how these technologies actually work. Now that you're familiar with these basic terms, let's move to a concept um, that you may already be comfortable with called trust. Uh, and we'll talk about how trust works in a decentralized network like Bitcoin or Lightning. You'll often hear people calling Bitcoin and the Lightning Network trustless. Um, at first glance, this is confusing. After all, isn't trust a good thing? Banks even use it in their names. Uh, isn't a trustless system, a system devoid of trust, a bad thing? Well, the use of the word trustless is intended to convey the ability to operate without needing trust in the other participants in the system. In a decentralized system like Bitcoin, you can always choose to transact with someone you trust. However, the system ensures you can't be cheated even if you can't trust the other party in a transaction. Trust is a nice to have instead of a must have property of the system. Contrast that to traditional systems like banking where you must place your trust in a third party since it controls your money. If the bank violates your trust, you may be able to find some recourse from a regulator or a court system, but at an enormous cost of time, money, and effort. Trustless does not mean devoid of trust. It means that trust is not a necessary prerequisite to transactions, and you can transact even with people you don't trust because the system prevents cheating. Before we get into how the Lightning Network works, it's important to understand one basic concept that underlines Bitcoin and Lightning, something we call a fairness protocol. A fairness protocol is a way to achieve fair outcomes between participants who do not need to trust each other without the need for a central authority, and it is the backbone of decentralized systems like Bitcoin. So let's talk about fairness in financial transactions without a central authority. When people have competing interests, how can they establish enough trust to engage in some cooperative or transactional behavior? The answer to this question lies at the core of several scientific and humanistic disciplines, such as economics, sociology, behavioral psychology, and mathematics. Some of these disciplines give us soft answers that depend on concepts such as reputation, fairness, morality, and even religion. Other disciplines give us concrete answers that depend only on the assumption that the participants will act rationally in their interactions with their self-interest as a main objective. There are a few ways to ensure fair outcomes and in interactions between individuals who may have competing interests, including require trust, rule of law, trusted third parties, game theoretical fairness protocols, and so on. So 
from a require trust perspective, you only interact with people whom you already trust due to prior interactions, reputation, or family relationships. This works well enough at a small scale, in a small community, especially within families and small groups. And it's the most common basis for cooperative behavior. Unfortunately, it doesn't scale and it suffers from tribal bias or in group bias. Rule of law. Establish rules for interactions that are enforced by an institution like a court system. The scale's better, but it cannot scale globally due to differences in customs and traditions, as well as inability to scale the institutions of enforcement. One side effect of this solution is that the institutions become more and more powerful as they get bigger, and that can lead to corruption. Trusted third party. Put an intermediary in every interaction to enforce fairness. Combined with the rule of law to provide oversight of intermediaries, the scale's better, but it suffers from an imbalance of power. The intermediaries get very powerful and can attract corruption. Concentration of power leads to systematic risk and systematic, systematic failure. Uh, game theory, fairness protocols. The last category emerges from the combination of the internet and cryptography and is the subject of what we're going to be talking about. Let's see how it works and what its advantages and disadvantages are. So let's start with trusted protocols without intermediaries. Cryptographic systems like Bitcoin and the Lightning Network are systems that allow you to transact with people and computers that you don't trust. This is often referred to as a trustless operation, even though it's not actually trustless. You have trust in the software and the protocol that you run, and you trust that the protocol implemented in the software will result in fair outcomes. The big distinction between a cryptographic system like this and a traditional financial system is that in traditional finance, you have a trusted third party, for example, a bank, to ensure that outcomes are fair. A significant problem with such systems is that they give too much power to the third party and they're vulnerable to a single point of failure. If the trusted third party itself violates trust or attempts to cheat, the basis of trust breaks. As you study cryptographic systems, you will notice a certain pattern. Instead of relying on a trusted third party, these systems attempt to prevent unfair outcomes by using a system of incentives and disincentives. In cryptographic systems, you place trust in the protocol, which is effectively a system with a set of rules that, if properly designed, will correctly apply the desired incentives and disincentives. The advantage of this approach is twofold. Not only do you avoid trusting a third party, you also reduce the need to enforce fair outcomes. So long as participants follow the agreed protocol and stay within the system, the incentive mechanism is in that protocol achieves fair outcomes without enforcement. The u Let's continue on for discussion of game theory and fairness protocol. The use of incentives and disincentives to achieve fair outcomes is one aspect of a branch of mathematics called game theory which studies models of strategic interaction among rational decision makers. Cryptographic systems that control financial interactions between participants, including Bitcoin and Lightning, rely heavily on game theory to prevent participants from cheating and allow participants who don't trust each other to achieve fair outcomes. While game theory and its use in cryptographic systems may appear uh, confusing and unfamiliar, chances are that you're already familiar with these systems in your everyday life, you just don't recognize them. In the following section, we'll use a simple example from childhood to help us identify the basic pattern. Once you understand the basic pattern, you'll see it everywhere in the blockchain space and you'll come to recognize it quickly and intuitively. And so we're gonna call this pattern a fairness protocol and we'll define that as a process that uses a system of incentives and or disincentives to ensure fair outcomes for participants who don't trust each other. Enforcement of a fairness protocol is only necessary to ensure that participants can't escape the incentives or disincentives. All right, so let's take the classic example of a game theory fairness protocol that almost everyone's familiar with from uh, growing up. Imagine a family lunch with a parent and two children. These children are fussy eaters and the only thing they're gonna agree on to eat 
is fried potatoes. The parent has prepared a bowl of fried potatoes or french fries or chips. Uh, the two siblings have to share this plate of chips. The parent has to ensure a fair distribution of chips to each child. Otherwise, the parent will have to hear constant complaining, maybe all day. And there's always a possibility of an unsure situation is escalating to fighting between the kids. What should a parent do? There are a few different ways that fairness can be achieved in the strategic interaction between two siblings who don't trust each other and have competing interests. The naive but commonly used method for the is for the parent to use their authority as a trusted third party to try and split the bowl of chips evenly into two servings. Uh, this is similar to traditional finance, where a bank, accountant, or lawyer acts as a trusted third party to prevent any cheating between two parties who want to transact. The problem with this scenario is that it vests a lot of power and responsibility in the hands of the trusted third party. In this example, the parent is fully responsible for the equal allocation of the chips, and the parties merely wait, watch, and complain if they don't feel that, you know, the children accuse the parents of playing favorites and not allocating the chips fairly. The siblings might fight over the chips, yelling that that chip is bigger and dragging the parent into their argument. It sounds awful, doesn't it? Should the parent yell louder, um, take all the chips away, threaten to never make chips again, and let these ungrateful ch children go hungry? There is a better solution. Uh, we go with a game called Split and Choose that the kids are taught to play. At each lunch, one sibling will split the bowl of chips into two servings, and then the other child gets to choose which serving they want. Almost immediately, the siblings will figure out the dynamic of this game. If the one splitting the chips makes a mistake or tries to cheat, the other sibling can essentially punish them by choosing the bigger bowl. It is in the best interest of both siblings, but especially the one splitting the bowl to play fair. Only the cheater loses in the scenario. The parent doesn't have to use their authority, and they don't have to enforce fairness. All the parent has to do is enforce the protocol. As long as the siblings cannot escape their assigned roles of splitter and chooser, the protocol itself ensures a fair outcome without any need for any intervention by the parent. The parent can't play favorites or distort the outcome. Now, in order for a fairness protocol like this to work, there need to be certain security guarantees, which we're gonna call security primitives. And these security primitives can be combined to ensure enforcement. Uh, the first security primitive in this particular scenario is a strict time ordering or sequencing. You know, the splitting of the chips happens before you choose which bowl you get. Uh, unless you can guarantee that action A happens before action B, um, the protocol will fall apart. You know, if, if one person selects bowl number two before the chips are split evenly, then you can have some problems. Um, the second security primitive is commitment when non-repudiation. Each sibling must commit to their choice of role, either splitter or chooser. Uh, again, once the splitting has been completed, the splitter is committed to the split. They can't repudiate their choice and go try again. Cryptographic systems offer a number of security primitives that can be combined in different ways to construct a fairness protocol. In addition to the two we just saw, the sequencing and the commitment, um, some of the others include things like hash functions to fingerprint data as a form of commitment or as a basis for a digital signature, digital signatures for authentication, non-repudiation, and proof of ownership of a secret, and encryption and decryption to restrict access to information to authorized participants only. This is a small list of what security and cryptographic primitives uh, can do. More basic primitives and combinations are being created all the time. In our real life example, we saw one form of fairness protocol called split and choose. That's one of several different fairness protocols that can be built uh, by combining our security primitives in different ways. But the basic pattern is always the same. Two or more participants interact without trusting each other by engaging in a series of steps that are part of an agreed upon protocol. 
protocols, steps, range, incentives, and disincentives to ensure that if participants are rational, cheating is counterproductive, and fairness is the outcome. Informness, enforcement is not necessary to get a fair outcome. Enforcement is only necessary to keep the participants from uh, following the protocol and not breaking out of the protocol. Now that you understand this basic pattern, we're going to start seeing it everywhere in Bitcoin, Lightning Network, and other systems. Let's look at a specific example, the most prominent example of which is Bitcoin's consensus algorithm, Proof of Work. In Bitcoin, miners compete to verify transactions and aggregate those transactions in blocks. To ensure that the miners do not cheat without entrusting them with authority, Bitcoin uses a system of incentives and disincentives. Miners have to use electricity and hardware systems to do work that is embedded as a proof inside the block. This is achieved because of a property of hash functions where the output value is randomly distributed across a range of possible outputs. If miners succeed in producing a valid block fast enough, they are rewarded by earning the block reward for that block. Forcing miners to use electricity before the network considers their block means that the miners have an incentive to correctly validate the transactions in the block. If the miners cheat or make a mistake, their block will be rejected and the electricity they use to prove the block will be wasted. No one needs to force miners to produce valid blocks. The reward and the punishment incentivize the miners to produce a valid block. All the protocol needs to do is ensure that only valid blocks that contain the proof of work are accepted. The fairness protocol can also be found in many different aspects of the Lightning Network. Uh, those who fund channels make sure they have a refund transaction signed before they publish the funding transaction. Whenever a channel is moved to a new state, the old state is revoked by ensuring that if anyone tries to broadcast it, they lose the entire balance and get punished. Those who forward payments know that if they commit funds forward, they can either get a refund or get paid by the node preceding them. Again and again, throughout Bitcoin and on the Lightning Network and other cryptographic uh, protocols, we see this pattern of the fairness protocol. Fair outcomes are not enforced by an authority. They emerge as a natural consequence of a protocol that rewards fairness and punishes cheating. A fairness protocol that harnesses self-interest by directing it towards fair outcomes. Uh, Bitcoin and the Lightning Network are both implementations of fairness protocols. So why do we need the Lightning Network? Is, isn't Bitcoin enough? Let's talk about the motivation for the Lightning Network. Bitcoin is a system that records transactions on a globally replicated public ledger. Every Bitcoin transaction is seen, validated, and stored by every participating computer that participates in the Bitcoin protocol. As you can imagine, there's a lot of data being stored on all these Bitcoin nodes, and it's difficult to scale that much data across that many participating computers. As Bitcoin and the demand for Bitcoin transactions grows, the number of transactions in each block has increased uh, until uh, it's re reached its current block size limit. Once blocks are full, excess Bitcoin transactions are left to wait in a queue. Uh, users will increase the fees they're willing to pay to buy space for their transactions in the next block if they believe their transaction is of high priority. If demand for Bitcoin transactions continues to outpace the capacity of the Bitcoin network, an increasing number of users' transactions could be left waiting unconfirmed. Competition for transaction fees could also increase the cost of each transaction, making many smaller value transactions, like microtransactions, uneconomical during periods of particularly high demand. To solve this problem, one option would be to increase the block size, size limit to create space for more transactions. An increase in the supply of block space could lead to a lower price equilibrium for transaction fees. However, increasing block size shifts the cost to node operators and requires them to expend more resources to validate uh, the blocks and then to store the full blockchain. Because blockchains our gossip protocols, each node is to 
is required to know and validate every single transaction that occurs on the network. Furthermore, once validated, each transaction block must be propagated in the node's neighbors, multiplying the bandwidth requirements. As such, the greater the block size, the greater the bandwidth processing the storage requirements for each individual node. And increasing transa Bitcoin transaction capacity in that way would have the undesirable effect of centralizing the system by reducing the number of nodes and node operators. Since node operators are not compensated for running nodes, if nodes are very expensive to run, only a few well-funded node operators will continue to load nodes. So the side effect of increasing the block size or decreasing the block time with respect to the centralization of the network would be severe. Uh, let's take a look at some example calculations. Let's assume the usage of Bitcoin grows that the network has to process 40,000 transactions per second, which is the approximate transaction processing level of the Visa network during peak usage around Christmas time. If we look at, uh, say, an average of 250 bytes per Bitcoin transaction, this would result in a data stream of about 10 megabytes per second, or 80 megabits per second, just to be able to receive all the transactions. That doesn't even include the traffic overhead of forwarding the transaction information to other peers. While 10 megabits per second does not seem extreme in the context of high-speed fiber optics and 5G mobile speeds, it would effectively exclude anyone who can't meet this requirement from running a node, especially in countries where high-performance internet is not available or widely available. Users also have many other demands in their bandwidth and can't be expected to expend this much only to receive transactions. Furthermore, storing this information would result in 864 gigabytes per day, roughly one terabyte of data per day, um, or the size, you know, a, a reasonable hard drive. Verifying 40,000 elliptic curve digital signatures, which is part of the validation process, per second is also going to be really uh, questionable. Uh, making the initial block download of the Bitcoin blockchain where you synchronize and verify everything almost impossible without extremely expensive hardware. Hardware. While 40,000 transactions per second seems like a lot, uh, that would only enable Bitcoin to achieve parity with traditional pay financial payment systems like Visa at peak times. Innovations in machine-to-machine -machine payments, microtransactions, and other applications might even push demand several orders of magnitude higher than that. Simply put, you can't scale the Bitcoin blockchain to validate the entire world's transactions in a decentralized way. But what if each node wasn't required to know and validate every single transaction? What if there was a way to have scalable off-chain transactions without losing the security of the Bitcoin network? So in February of 2015, Joseph Poon and Thaddeus Dreija proposed a possible solution to the Bitcoin scalability problem with the publication of their white paper, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, Scalable Off-Chain Instant Payments. In the white paper, uh, Poon and Dreija estimated that in order for Bitcoin to reach uh, 47,000 transactions per second processed at peak by Visa, it would require 8 gigabyte blight, byte blocks as opposed to you know, the current uh, one megabyte blocks that Bitcoin has. That would make running a node untenable for anyone but large scale enterprises and industrial grade operations. The result would be a network in which only a few users could actually validate the state of the ledger. Bitcoin relies on users validating the ledgers for themselves as part of their security without explicitly trusting third parties in order to stay decentralized and secure. Pricing users out of running nodes would force the average user to trust third parties to discover the state of the ledger, ultimately breaking the trust model of Bitcoin. So instead, the Lightning Network proposes a new network, a second layer, where users can make payments to each other's peer-to-peer -peer without the necessity of publishing a transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain for each payment. Users may pay each other in the Lightning Network as many times as they want without creating additional Bitcoin transactions or incurring on-chain fees. They only make use of the Bitcoin blockchain to load Bitcoin on the Lightning Network initially and to settle, that is to remove Bitcoin from the Lightning Network. The result is that many more Bitcoin payments can take place off-chain with only the initial loading and final settlement transactions needing to be validated and stored by Bitcoin nodes. Aside from 
reducing the burden on nodes, payment on the payments on the Lightning Network can be cheaper for users because they do not need to pay block Bitcoin fees and more private for users because they're not published to all participants of the network and furthermore are not stored permanently. While the Lightning Network was initially conceived for Bitcoin, it can theoretically be implemented on any blockchain to meet some basic technical requirements. Other blockchains like Lightning Coin are already in the process of supporting the Lightning Network. And several other blockchains are developing similar layer two solutions to help them scale. So let's talk about the Lightning Network's defining features. The Lightning Network is a network that operates as a second layer protocol on top of Bitcoin and other blockchains. The Lightning Network enables fast, secure, private, trustless, and permissionless payments. Here are some of the features of the Lightning Network. Uh, users of the Lightning Network can route payments to each other for low cost and in real time. Users who exchange value over the Lightning Network do not need to wait for block confirmations for payments. Um, so already we're seeing some speed benefits over Bitcoin as well as being lower cost. Once a payment on the Lightning Network has completed, usually within a few seconds, it is final and cannot be reversed. Like a Bitcoin transaction, a payment on the Lightning Network can only be refunded by the recipient. Whereas on-chain transactions are broadcast and verified by all nodes in the network, Payments routed on the Lightning Network are transmitted between pairs of nodes and are not visible to everyone, resulting in much greater privacy than the privacy you receive from Bitcoin. Unlike transactions on the Bitcoin network, payments routed on the Lightning Network do not need to be stored permanently. Lightning thus uses a lot fewer storage resources and hence is cheaper. This property also has benefits for privacy. The Lightning Network uses onion routing, that's similar to the protocol used by the Onion Router Tor, um, so that even the nodes involved in routing a payment are only directly aware of their predecessor and successor nodes in the payment route and won't necessarily know who the, pay the payment sender and receivers are. When used on top of Bitcoin, the Lightning Network uses real Bitcoins, which is always in the possession or custody and full control of the user. Lightning is not a separate token or a coin. It is actually Bitcoins. So let's take a to better understand how the Lightning Network uses and why people use it. Um, we'll be going through, you know, several different use cases in later lectures. We'll talk about consumers and merchants. We'll talk about software, service businesses, and so on, uh, all using Lightning. So in this introductory lecture, we talked about the fundamental concept that underlies both Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, the Fairness Protocol. We looked at the history of the Lightning Network and the motivations behind second layer scaling solutions for Bitcoin and other blockchain-based networks. We learned basic terminology, including nodes, payment channel, on-chain tran on transactions, and off-chain uh, payments. And we talked about the fact that you know, Lightning Network is not a blockchain itself, but it's a layer two that relies upon the Bitcoin blockchain. And we talked about how the Fairness Protocol uses a system of incentives and disincentives to ensure fair outcomes for participants who, who don't trust each other. And that enforcement is only necessary to ensure that the participants follow the Fairness Protocol. And we also talked about the fact that um, Bitcoin and Lightning Network both provide the trust using the Fairness Protocol. Um, and that Lightning is really necessary for the next stage of scaling Bitcoin, both from a speed and a transaction cost perspective. And that the Bitcoin blockchain is really only used with Lightning to keep track of transactions to load Bitcoin onto the Lightning Network initially and to settle when we uh, eventually remove Bitcoin from the Lightning Network. But all the transactions that happen in between uh, can be done purely on the Lightning Network. And we'll talk about this in much greater detail as we go on.